Thank you for tuning in to Macroview Television, and welcome to a brand new edition of Taiwan Outlook, the program that presents the different faces and lets you hear their stories on Taiwan. I'm your host, Wu Rei Guo. Choosing to be a concert pianist is never an easy career choice. It takes a lot of initiative, dedication, and also hard work. On today's program, we're going to meet one of them from Taiwan, and she has won many international competitions and recognitions over the years. And she is Gwyneth Chen, who is a special guest on our program. We are very delighted to have her. Welcome to our program, Gwyneth. Hello, I'm Gwyneth Chen. I'm yes. very happy to be here to well, have a conversation with the Taiwanese public. Of course. And then uh, we're very happy to have you on the program, like I said. And Gwyneth, please tell us a little bit about, you know, about yourself, because we knew that you were born in Xinzhu, Taiwan, mm -hmm. but you left Taiwan at the age of nine mm -hmm. to the United States. And tell us a little bit about your you know, a process of getting a music education in Taiwan as well as in the United States. Uh, I was born in Taiwan, in Xinzhou, mm -hmm. and I started the piano when I was five years old okay. in kindergarten mm. by uh, following the music teacher who was playing the piano mm -hmm. while we were supposed to be dancing and singing. Okay. But instead, I was imitating the music teacher playing okay. the piano mm -hmm. and already imitating in a very fast way, you know, already speeding at the piano, mm -hmm. <laughs> only five years old, and I hadn't had any formal training yet. So I started the piano then, and I knew from day one that I wanted to be a pianist. That's what I always wanted to do every day of my life until now. Okay. Never a day of regret. Okay, but let me ask you, uh -huh. were there anybody else in your family? maybe had piano lessons or they were performing, that might, you know, that might have been the source of inspiration for you. No, I'm the only um, oh. musician in the family. Good. Actually, my parents weren't even acquainted with classical music at the time. Um, I fought you know, no. to, for the piano lessons. Good. And I didn't have a piano either. I was given a toy piano. Okay. <laughs> they thought it's just something that's going to go away. Yes, yeah, so That you were fascinated was... with piano for a while, but mm -hmm. you're not going to be serious. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, at the you know, tender age of five, that you dream of one day being a pianist. But as you, you know, getting older, were you ever told by friends or family members that this is going to be a very difficult and demanding choice for you? Um, no, no one's ever told me that. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out later on that it's a lot of hard work. Of course, yes. <laughs> um, but I'm very, very happy with the hard work, which I will speak about later. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. When sacrifice becomes uh, something that's priceless, mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so I started the piano at age five in Taiwan. Okay. And I continued in Taiwan until I was nine years old. Then okay. my family emigrated to the United States, to mm. Los Angeles. All right. And um. there I met a very, very good piano teacher and pianist. Okay. Uh, he's Robert Turner, who was one of the best piano teachers in America at good. the time. So I was very lucky mm -hmm. to have um, very proper training and very strong foundation. Good, and uh, let me ask you this, and uh, we understand this is you know, not an easy you know, road to take, and uh, we have also learned that you used to get up without you know, demands from your parents or your teacher. You will get up at five o'clock in the morning, then you will automatically start practicing piano. And uh, you felt, you know, this training process is sort of like Chinese Kung Fu. <laughs> uh, you were building the foundation or building the nei gong, your mm -hmm. nei gong. And then the, how, you know, what, what is your personal philosophy, you know, philosophy at the time? Because you were, you know, still very young, you know, and then the, you probably didn't know, you know, mm -hmm. what were, you know, the things that were ahead of you. You know, what was going through your mind that you were able to motivate yourself, you know, get up every morning at five o'clock and practice? It was just not only for the love of music, but the love of having the keyboard mm. in my hands. Okay. I loved feeling the keys in my hands, in my fingers. I okay. loved to move my fingers. Even until now, I love to play and it 
didn't matter whether I was performing or practicing. I just love to play. And okay. um, a lot of people can't understand why I spend so much time in the practice room. Exactly. But I really love to play. It's okay. as simple as that. <laughs> okay. But let me ask you, I mean, at that time, maybe a lot of your peers, mm -hmm. you know, they were going out to the garden, to the park, mm -hmm. to play. And then they say, Gwyneth, why don't you come with us? Uh, you probably going to have to say almost every time, say, you know, I can't. I got to practice on piano. Was it, was it difficult for you? Because uh, it's not going to be easy to hold a friendship that way. Um, no, I, I, ha I was a very special child. <laughs> I would imagine. Yes. I didn't like to play yeah. outdoors so okay. much. All right. I was very quiet and okay. very shy. All right. Yeah, I was a very introverted child. Okay. And I love to spend a lot of time on, on one thing and to be very Good. focused. And this certainly you know, mm -hmm. proved to be a very important decision for you mm -hmm. and it certainly you know, turned out to be a wonderful mm -hmm. experience for you so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, we understand that you have been many different competitions you know, piano competitions over the years. I think the first one I want to mention is that you won, you know, in the U.S. 50 state, mm -hmm. you know, national piano competition. And uh, that wasn't easy. You know, think about all the young people available, you know, at the time they're competing for the piano prize. And tell, you know, tell us what was going through your mind and then the, what kept you going, you know, say this is, mm -hmm. you know, something I wanted to do can't give up. Well, I was very lucky because I met a very, very good teacher, Robert Turner, who mm. um, put me in a lot of competitions, okay. not because he wanted me to compete no. or to win, but he wanted me to play. He just wanted me to have as much experience as possible on stage. Okay. Performing experience, he thought, was so, so much more worthwhile than mm -hmm than uh, staying in the practice room. Of course. So I was doing, um, while the other kids were playing on the weekends or going to the mall, uh, going to the movies, I was doing competitions every weekend. And from winning the competitions, I played concerts. Well, not uh, big concerts, but mm -hmm. performances. Okay. So those were my weekend activities, was okay. doing playing in competitions. Mm -hmm. And I love to play in competitions because mm -hmm. I was trained that the result didn't matter. No. So I just went up there and played. Every weekend I went up there and played, didn't matter which competition. So I started out with a smaller competition, which was the LA local competition. Okay. Well, that he had entered me in the national competition, which took half a, a period of half a year, yeah, six I months. Yeah, I imagine different stages. Yes, yeah. so mm -hmm. the first stage, it was four stages. First mm -hmm. stage was the LA regional. regional. Mm -hmm. Then I won the LA regional. Then I competed with uh, Northern California. Okay. Then I won the California state. Yes. Um, and as the California state winner, I went on to the Southwest division, okay. another regional. Okay. Then I won the Southwest seven state. Okay. And from the Southwest, I went on to the national finals. And that was when I was in seventh grade junior high. Yeah, that's um, very impressive. So yes. it was six months, and and mm -hmm. I, I just kept playing in every weekend, and I was doing other competitions at the same time and mm -hmm. performances. So I really, really loved to play. It didn't matter competitions or concerts. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, one of the reasons was was also I was winning. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, almost all the competitions. Yes. So it was even more fun for me. Okay. I was winning winning them. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. uh, winning the junior high uh, national piano mm -hmm. competition was already mm -hmm. a, a big honor. Okay. And then I continue on to the high school division, Good. again the national competition. Okay. Um, so, you know, it I was, was very lucky to proceed, uh -huh, to proceed again to the final round. Okay. But something mm -hmm. happened before the final round. What happened? I played volleyball in school and I sprained my finger 10 oh, days okay. before the competition. Oh, mm -hmm. So... Um, what did you do? I mean... So I couldn't play for a week. And just three days before the competition, I took uh -huh. the wooden splint off. Okay. And I started to play just three days before the competition. And before that, it was just really mental preparation, mental practice, mm -hmm. uh, which I was also trained to do okay. uh, very well before that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I prepared for three days. I mm -hmm. went to play. And 
I won again yeah, the course. high school division, and only after I won, mm -hmm. um, my teacher showed me the local newspaper. It took place in Oregon at the time. The local newspaper, which said it was it was uh, published the day before the finals mm -hmm. that if Chen wins again, mm -hmm. she will break the American record okay. for winning both the junior high and the high, high school, school division okay. in the national piano Compet competition. Yes. And my teacher didn't show me that in oh, order uh, not to give me pressure. Okay. So until after until the, at the day after the competition. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I had a very good teacher. <laughs> yes, of course. And uh, looking back, mm -hmm. you know, for your you know learning under Mr. Turner, mm -hmm. you know, what was one of you know one or two things that you felt that you have learned the most from him? Uh, whether it's being you know mentally preparation. Mm -hmm. Uh, or is it something about you know on stage performance? Mm -hmm. Well, the most important thing was I, I was at the age when I needed a very strong foundation, okay. and he gave me a very very strong solid foundation, mm -hmm. which he told me would um, enable me to flourish okay. later on. Right. It would it, it can make me fly and soar later yes. on. Mm -hmm. But um, besides the strong foundation. I thought I learned the whole package. It was a package deal. Yes. It wasn't just piano lessons. No. It was also learning about virtue, you know, from Mr. Turner. I mean, he came to the lessons in a suit and tie every time. Okay. And, and he was a very noble man. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned the whole package. And also the lessons were very systematic and very structured. Okay. So I thought I learned the whole package. And it was I, a very effective way for you to learn. Very solid. <laughs> yeah, to lay that foundation. Mm -hmm. And Gwyneth, we were talking about your you know, very successful you know, competition at the U.S. You know, national level. And after that, of course, you went on to international and bigger challenges for yourself. And uh, one of which I want to bring up is the, you know, in the year of 1990, that you actually, you know, was one of the finalists, you know, and the only participant from Taiwan originally at the Tchaikovsky International Piano Competition. This is sort of like the Olympics of, you know, piano competition. And it's a, you know, huge deal, you know, tremendous. And you were barely 20 years old at the time. And what was going through your mind and going through the competition, meeting all these very gifted, very talented musicians from other, you know, other parts of the world? You know, until now, I still give, a, give myself a pat on the shoulder. Yes. I thought I was very brave mm. to go there by myself. Oh, okay. um, so it was in 1990. Imagine Moscow in 1990. Yes, there wasn't much different. to buy. No. And there wasn't much to eat because there weren't very many restaurants. Okay. And this was a Tchaikovsky competition which mm. took place in Moscow. Mm -hmm. um, it happens only once every four years. So there were about um, 100, uh, actually exactly 120 contestants, maybe from 20 different countries. Okay. And I remember so well, I was number 118. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Even though they were 120, yeah. only 116 played uh -huh. because can you imagine four withdrew because they were too nervous. Yes, too much pressure. Too much pressure and I think two got sick mm. and two just cried so much before they went on stage. Finally, yeah, they didn't lost go on stage. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so only 116 played and everyone came in the team. You know, they, mm. they went with their teacher, their family, mm -hmm. and media from their country. So they came in a team of 40, 50, I remember there were maybe 38 contestants from Japan, and maybe 20 from, um, from China, mm -hmm. and 23 from the USA, or even more. Mm -hmm. And I was the only one from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. No parents, no teacher, and no media. Mm -hmm. And I, I was there alone. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what was going on. They didn't know where Taiwan was. You know, everyone was assigned a translator. Mm -hmm. I was assigned a Spanish translator because they didn't know <laughs> what language we spoke mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Yeah, <laughs> so basically, mm -hmm. I had no translator. Mm -hmm. So the competition um, uh, uh, took 28 days. 
Uh, so I stayed mm -hmm. in Moscow for 28, 28 days. days. Okay. Um, the first round alone was 10 days. And it was very, a very, mm -hmm. how should I say, a nerve wracking experience because, mm -hmm. I mean, it was just so monumental, such a monumental experience. You know, here I am playing in this historical competition at mm -hmm. the Great Hall of the Moscow Conservatory. Okay. And there are 20 jury members sitting across the, the hall mm. from left to right. Then these are 20 of the most uh, esteemed pianists in the world. Mm. Then I have the portrait of Tchaikovsky on my left, you know, <laughs> huge portrait of Tchaikovsky. Every day it was a full house. Yes. Because it's a historical event. Yeah, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, but I have to say the cruelest thing was that every day after the competition was over, there mm. was a bulletin board where, where they posted everyone who scored under 17 points. Really? The they highest, posted? Yes, the highest was 25 points. But if you got under 17, you can leave the next day, okay. the next we morning. Will not see Actually, you, next you, day. you are asked yeah. to leave the oh. next morning. Okay. Um, because there's no chance for you to to pass to mm, the to second round. The next round. Yes. yes. Oh. Um, uh -huh. So every day, you know, it's like a blacklist. Of every course. day after yeah. the competition, it's not even the end of the first round yet. No. Every day after the, the at the end of the day, yeah. um, all the contestants who play that day, they rush to that bulletin board to see if their name is on the blacklist, to see if they have to leave the next yeah. day. So, uh, 116 played and only 40 passed to the second round. Okay. So, you know, much less people, only 40 in the second round. And then from the second round to the final round is uh -huh. the hardest. Of course. Because everyone, there are only 12 in the final round. Mm. And everyone who is a finalist, it's, you know, it's, makes it's a, history. Yes, it's yes. a huge recognition. Yes, yes. It's, mm -hmm. they make history. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember waiting for the final round, the result yeah. of the final round, and I was so nervous, uh -huh. um, thinking, you know, all these pianists are so great. Mm -hmm. How can they choose 12 yes. uh -huh. out of these 40 great pianists? So I was very lucky mm -hmm. to be one of the 12 finalists. I was the only Asian, and yes. I was the only female finalist. Really? Yes, the only female. Uh -huh. Um, you see, the piano competition is not like sports where they separate the no, male and female in different no. categories. Mm -hmm. We compete together. Mm. Um, so I was in the finals and I played last because I'm number 118. Uh -huh. um, it was, um, I, I, yeah. I cannot even describe the experience. It was so of lonely yes. because there were only 12 people left of course. On, yeah. on campus. Yeah. Uh, there weren't many people and I remember just practicing all the time and there was not much food. No. There was no one to help me look for food. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I survived till the end of the competition okay. and you would think I'm going to tell you I won. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't. No, I but, was. <laughs> I mean, just being one of the twelve finalists mm -hmm. is a huge recognition. Mm -hmm. It means all the hard work and dedication that you have given to mm -hmm. piano has really been recognized by some of the best and most, re, you know, renowned mm -hmm. pianists around the world. And the competition itself is not anybody who can, you know, just be a part mm -hmm. of it. You know, you have to have, you have to the go national screening. Exactly. You have to have the qualification. Exactly. So, and I was only 19. Yeah. It was my first international piano competition, my oh. first experience. Yeah, you go, you know, so. you shoot for the top, <laughs> yes. But you certainly, yeah. I would imagine your mm -hmm. parents, your family, mm -hmm. and also your teacher at the time, mm -hmm. were very, very proud of what you did. And my school was very yeah. proud too. Yeah, of Julia course, school. it's a huge accomplishment. Um, yes. However, I was awarded the best female prize. Oh, okay, <laughs> And they presented a fur coat to me oh, on stage. Okay. Good, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about another competition mm -hmm. that you were part of. And this competition is also very prestigious, mm -hmm. and this time you won. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the evil Poto Relich. Relich. Mm -hmm. yes, competition. And this is something, again, you know, recognized as one of the top 
piano mm -hmm. competitions in the world. And then you won the top prize, you know, you won the competition mm -hmm. and won the, you know, 100,000 US dollars. And then the, not just the money, but just the fact that mm -hmm. you won this huge international competition. Please and share with us this experience. So this was three years later, 1993. Okay. And I remember one day walking the corridor of uh, Juilliard School. Okay. And some of my classmates had a piece of paper dangling in their hand. They say, hey, look, Eva <laughs> Pogrilich um, uh, has a competition, $100,000. And okay. I said, no way, uh -huh. $100,000, that's unheard of. Mm -hmm. I said, you got to, that's like winning a lottery. Uh -huh. It's impossible to win that. Who's going to win that? Uh -huh. And, and you know, we're all talking about it. And they said, well, why don't we all go? I said, yeah, let's go. So, you know, maybe four or five of, of us from Julia, we all went to the competition. And um, this is again, uh, three rounds. Okay. Uh, it was shorter, it was only maybe 21 days, about three weeks. Okay. Um, Still. Yeah. Yes, but mm. it was different in a way that there was no upper age limit. Yes. The oldest contestant at the time was 47. And, w -H. <laughs> and a lot of them were my jury members from previous competitions. Okay. So I was competing with my jury, <laughs> yes. my, my judges yeah. from other competitions. Mm. Um, so I was very lucky you know, to pass from one round to the next and then to the final round. Mm -hmm. And I remember so well when they announced the winners for the mm. final round. It wasn't announced at the awards ceremony. They called us, there were eight finalists. They called us to a room okay. where there were only the, the founder of the competition and the jury mm -hmm. and the, final, the eight finalists. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they wanted us to know the result first. Okay. There were only two prizes, okay. first prize, second prize, and that's all. Okay. And three special prizes. And instead of calling the second prize first, you know, that's what they usually do. Yeah. They called, they just called first prize. They said first prize and at the time, my name was Edith Chen. I had a name change later on. Uh, so they called first prize, just like that. First, no, no preparation, mm -hmm. no warm up. First prize, Edith Chen. And I remember I didn't react. I didn't say anything. I mm -hmm. just stood there. Mm -hmm. Then they called the second prize. Then they announced the three special prizes and I got all three. And I felt, That's I have to say, impressive. I felt yes. so bad mm -hmm. because all the other finalists were just standing there without a prize uh -huh. and they kept calling my name every special prize they called edith chen uh -huh. and they called my name so many times uh -huh. and i want to say okay okay mm -hmm. i get it <laughs> mm -hmm, yes. you know it's enough i got the first prize and that's enough for me yes. but i got three additional prizes on top of the Terrific. first prize yes, yes. and mm -hmm. I, I have to say i was very very fortunate mm -hmm. not only to receive the prizes uh -huh but to receive a bigger prize, which came after that, uh -huh. which is? and which is studying with uh, Maestro Pogorilich himself and his teacher, whom he married, oh, who, who was okay. his wife. Okay. So I studied with Mr. and Mrs. Pogorilich, and I turned out to be their only student until yeah. now. Oh, terrific. Yeah, so yes. I was invited to their London home oh, to okay. have private lessons with them, with them. For, okay. for a long time. Okay. Gwyneth, what we're talking about, you winning the top prize and also the three special prizes at the, you know, 1993, I believe, the Evo Pogorilich you know, Rilich, uh, competition. And also, uh, we have learned that there was also the opportunity to study with Mastro Ivo Pogorelic and also his wife. And uh, tell us a little bit about this tremendous opportunity to study under one of the leading contemporary concert pianists in the world. And also, what was the experience like? What were some of the lessons that you have learned from him and his wife? Please. You see, you have to understand, Ivo Pogorilich was the superstar mm. of pianists in the 80s okay. and 90s. Yes. And um, just to see him during the competition was overwhelming already. Yeah. And to be in, yes. yes, and <laughs> for me to be invited by him and his wife, who was his teacher, uh -huh. to their London home, 
to study with them, to be their student, you know, was the biggest prize ever for me in yeah, my life. I would imagine. I mean, yes. when I got there, every day was a, I, it was an eye-opening experience for me. Everything they showed me, I, I was flabbergasted every okay. day. I can still remember how I felt, and um, I remember so well. Mm -hmm. I got there, and they had four pianos at home. And they lived in the woods, and I didn't know I was going to be trained like a Shaolin monk in the woods, <laughs> <All right. You're laughs> in the isolated, mountains, yes. completely isolated. Mm. I played for them, mm. and uh, Mrs. Pogorilich, who was Alice uh, Ketsorazzi, she told me, how you play now is in her Russian, zero, mm. she really? said, zero. I was very direct, yes, very heavy. And I said, yes. You chose me as the winner. Yeah, you know, top prize. I am the grand prize winner of your competition. I won every prize in your competition. What do you mean I'm zero? What about the other pianists? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. And zero. And I'm thinking, I have won every competition there is. I've, I'm playing professionally as a pianist. You know, since I was 17, I'm, I'm signed by Columbia Artists mm. uh, Management. I've played so many concerts. and. I'm one of the top pianists at Julia. What do you mean yes. my playing is zero? Mm. My face was one minute blue, one minute green, uh -huh. one minute black, one minute red. I'm thinking, how come I never learned this? How come I didn't know any of this? And she showed me only maybe 1% of her Kung Fu. And so I stay there for, I would stay there for three weeks to a month at a time. Because, you know, I was still a student at the Juilliard oh, yeah, school, school at the time, and yes. I was cutting school to yeah. study with her. Mm -hmm. And so she was showing me special Kung Fu every day, and I was practicing for hours, mm -hmm. sometimes away from the piano. I mean, literally trained like a Shaolin monk, uh -huh. you know, different uh, parts of the muscle and even standing when I was practicing. Okay. And I, I would, they would train me for up to four hours at a time on one particular Kung Fu. Okay, so and, you want to make sure that you got it nailed yeah, down. Yeah, and they would be in uh, you know, other parts of the house, maybe in the kitchen or in their bedroom, and shouting from there. They can tell uh, the, in the sound yeah. I make. Sometimes I, th I think I'm standing when I was practicing. That's a okay. special kind of Kung Fu. And I, I'm thinking, uh -huh. if I sit for a second, it's yes. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I would sit down for a second. They would know immediately. They would shout from their room. Stand up, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're Gwyn not using this part of the muscle. Uh, yeah. you know? And Gwyneth, yes. what is even more special is that you know this type of relationship that you have continues even until today. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that you still go to you know their London home, and then you know stay with them and practice mm -hmm. and learn from the you know the, the you know the both of them, mm -hmm. and then the, how do you then describe this relationship? It is something ongoing, of course, but also I think is changing and also developing, evolving to the next level. Um, I think it's so important to spend time with a great master. Okay. Yes. In anything, yeah. in anything you want to learn, mm -hmm. not only to learn the skills, mm -hmm. but to, like I said, to learn the whole package. Yeah. And, you know, to learn how to be um, a complete musician. But okay. first of all, you have to be a complete person. Yes. A very full person. Yes, of course. Mm. And uh, another area that we'd we'll like to talk about is that we understand you receive your bachelor and also if you, you know, master's degree, both from one of the, you know, most prestigious, if not the most prestigious, you know, music school, piano school in the world, that is the Juilliard School of Music in New York City. Um, you know, we have, you know, some Taiwanese students mm -hmm. and also many Chinese students study there, but it is, you know, sort of like a mecca of, you know, mm -hmm. piano, you know, training in the world. And tell us about the years that you spent at Juilliard. And how did you think that experience helped you? You know, not only in terms of piano techniques, but also becoming, you know, you know a pianist, a concert pianist that's able to combine the different dimensions and elements that you probably were never exposed to before. 
Please. Mm -hmm. Well, I was at Julia for six years yes. uh, for my bachelor's and master's degree. Um, I have to say it's a very competitive school. Mm. And the level of playing is mm -hmm. very high okay. at the school. Mm -hmm. And that's very good for very good for me and very good for all the students there. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told it's very hard to get in. Yes. Um, but I was I have to say I was I was very brave. Mm -hmm. I that was the only college I applied to. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I only applied to one school. Mm -hmm. That was a Juilliard school and I got in. I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a very good teacher, but you know, it's not just, again, it's the whole package. It's not just being at Juilliard, but it's been in New York City. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, going to concerts at Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall and, you know, just at Juilliard just alone. Yourself, yes. Even the student recitals there were great. And our student orchestra was great, was mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. And we had great guest conductors coming to conduct our orchestra. So it was the whole package again. It was... Um, I have to say the level of your peers are really important. Uh, yeah. Of course. And uh, also we understand in 2011 mm -hmm. that you released a CD mm -hmm. called the Greenwich Chen, you know, Chopin Favorites. Favorites. And then the, this is something that's being recognized by Taiwan's Golden Melody Award as the best performance of the year. And uh, you won many international mm -hmm. competitions and recognitions, but this is the you know the first one from Taiwan. And let me ask you, what does it mean to you to win this you know award from your native Taiwan, and being recognized still as the best performance of the year? Um, I was very. I felt very honored, and I was very happy that for the first time when mm. I received an award. I can go on stage and give a speech. <laughs> yes. Normally, you only go to stage, go on stage to receive the award. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, I could actually give a speech, mm -hmm. and I gave the speech to my mom. Okay. Yeah, I kind of um, dedicated mm -hmm. the award to yeah. my mom because okay. she really, really sacrificed a lot for me. Yeah, but you also, mm -hmm. you know, done very well. You probably, mm -hmm. you know, all the accomplishments are way beyond their original expectations of you. So they are sure, um, you know, very sure. They're very proud of what you have, you know, have done. Mm -hmm. And also we understand that you have done some, you know, very impressive performances important performances in both Taiwan and China. You know, for example, you know, in Taiwan that you have performed in 1997 at the presidential office, you know, in front of President Li Denghui at the time. And also 2001, you have performed at Washington DC's Twin Oaks, our unofficial ambassador's, you know, mm -hmm. residence, and in front of the then First Lady Wu Shuzhen. And mm -hmm. uh, in 2008, you also performed in, you know, for President Ma Ying-jeou's, you know, uh, the inauguration. And uh, also in 2008, you performed at the Grand National Theater in Beijing uh, as part of the countdown concerts to the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Mm -hmm. And all these performances, they're all very impressive in front of, you know, important dignitaries. And uh, what did, you know, they mean to you? I mean, of course, it's a recognition of your skills, your accomplishments, but also was there anything else that you can share with us that these performances might have, you know, accomplished for you? Um, I am very proud to represent my country. Yes, okay. Especially after all the accomplishments abroad, mm -hmm. I'm very happy that my country invites me back okay. to uh, mm -hmm. to repay and okay. also to represent them. Okay. Um, I have some, oh, there are always some interesting stories from, from each concert. For President Li Denghui, mm -hmm. I remember <laughs> he sat in the first row. Uh -huh. And you know, piano playing can be very athletic and I perspire a lot when uh -huh. I play. And he said, during my performance to the person next to him, he said, you know, she's perspiring so much. Okay. Should I give her my handkerchief? <laughs> <laughs> it's very cute. Yes, yeah, it's very yeah, cute and yeah. very endearing. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Gwyneth, we understand that you have returned to Taiwan to take care of your parents. And then that you have also, in recent years, committed a lot of your time to charity work. And this is not something that we have, you know, heard of, mm -hmm. you know, in the past, a very accomplished pianist 
committing to charity work in his native, I mean, her native, you know, Taiwan. And uh, one of which is your association and commitment to Xuanhua Foundation. Mm -hmm. And they have actually, in appreciation and recognition of your commitment, they have, you know, you know, selected you in 2013 for the Distinguished Humanitarian Award. They have also published a book. You know, this is a book uh, based on your life, your education, and your training. Please tell us about your association with the Xuanhua Foundation. Uh, also, what does the experience mean to you? Well, the Xuanhua Foundation was founded by the late Chan Master Xuanhua, okay. who brought the Buddha Dharma to the West for 30 years okay. to the city of 10,000 Buddhas. Mm -hmm. And his legacy was education, translating books of wisdom, uh, setting up the Sangha and interfaith. Okay. So I fall into the category of education because mm -hmm. through my music, I try to open people's hearts okay. and to wake up people okay. and also to inspire people to improve themselves mm -hmm. and also to inspire the listeners to connect with their inner wealth mm -hmm. which they wouldn't have otherwise connected you know if it weren't for music so uh this is also the goal of my performances and also um the, the award also was awarded to me because of a filiality mm -hmm. award, yes. which I received uh, before then. Mm -hmm. And I really, really believe in filiality because I feel that being filial to your parents is like having very strong roots. Mm -hmm. It's like trees having to stand on very strong roots so that they can grow in a very solid way and they mm -hmm. can grow tall. I mean, most importantly is that mm -hmm. they have to grow. So I feel that paying respect, filial respect to your parents is very important. And also, it's a way of repaying kindness. So that's why, you know, in the last 10 years, I have spent more time just With taking care of my parents. And it's not very about good. being submissive no. either, you know, no. because I was a pretty rebellious kid <laughs> myself. Yes, so it's just repaying kindness. Okay. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you know, it's wonderful to see that you being recognized not just by your piano skills mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, talents, but also by something outside of the piano and music realm. And also the very next year, 2014, you were also appointed an ambassador mm -hmm by your know, service space. Mm -hmm. And this is also unusual recognition mm -hmm. for a concert pianist. Can you tell us a little bit about that you know, recognition and what does it mean to you? Okay, service space is a charity organization designed mm. around generosity. Okay. And we practice act of generosity. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you a personal example. For example, on my birthday, instead of going to a five-star restaurant with my family mm -hmm. or throwing a birthday party at home, I went to a local restaurant, um, a, a more uh, inexpensive restaurant, and I give, uh, for example, $300 or $400 to the owner. Okay. And I say, I tell the owner, um, I would like to treat everyone all the customers after me, who come after me. Okay. So this is called uh, pay it forward. Okay. And so, so the owner was shocked, uh, you know, what are you doing? And so with that money, it's not a big amount of money, but with that money, I was able to treat maybe a hundred customers who came after me. Mm -hmm. And it really made their day. They were very yeah. happy, you know, they're going, oh, we got, we got yes. a free dinner today. And yeah. I'm so happy. I'm saying to myself, I made all these people smile today. Mm -hmm. And that's practicing act of generosity. Yes. And by that, through that act, mm -hmm. these customers also learned uh, generosity and maybe mm -hmm. they can practice that also. Okay. Yeah. And then the, another thing that you mentioned briefly earlier is the recognition in 2014 for the filiality mm -hmm. award that was presented at the Taipei City Hall. 
And uh, like you said yourself, you made the conf- you know confession that growing up you were one of the you know more rebellious kid. And then the, you know it's not something that people probably at the time would expect when Gwyneth you know grows up that she's going to be taking care of her you know parents at the later years. And then the, tell us about your relationship with your parents. Because I would imagine when you were growing up, when you were doing all the training and doing all the practices, that you probably didn't have a lot of time or quality time with them. And then the, they didn't, like you said, they didn't know that the, you know, their daughter was going to take piano, was going to take you know, music so seriously. Mm-hmm. So it was something of a you know, learning process for them as well. And as you were growing up, they were learning about what you wanted to do. How did you, you know, both, you know, both sides come together at the later part of your training, of your education, and now you definitely are very close to them as Mm -hmm. they are, you know, in their, you know, later years. And uh, tell us a little bit about that process. Um, I've I've always been very close to my family. Oh, good. Um, Winning all the competitions also mm. enabled me to uh, pay for my own tuition, my, my piano tuition. Yeah. Not only that, and my own stipend, and not only that, to support my family really? since I was a kid. Yeah, and, but I was also very rebellious. Even now, I still am. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with being filial to your parents. You know, you can be kind to your parents, but still <laughs> being you know, a little assertive. Yes, you know. because, mm-hmm. you know, being a musician, you have to have a lot of individuality. Of course. And mm-hmm. it's a very different kind of life. And musicians, you know, they say artists are a different breed. <laughs> so <laughs> it's mainly the, the, the being the artist part and also the profession of a concertizing yes. musician. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not easy. No. It's not easy, and it also sometimes can conflict with the Taiwanese culture. Yes, so <laughs> you're still in the process of making minor mm-hmm. incremental adjustments. And um, any kind of relationship is always hard. Of course, hard. it's a learning process <laughs> yes. always, yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, Gwyneth, you are one of the few that have received education mm-hmm. you know, in classroom, also in you know, piano room, mm-hmm. uh, in both Taiwan and in the United States. Can you then give us some you know, suggestions or observations that you have made in terms of the two, you know, sometimes very different educational systems in Taiwan versus the one in the U.S. Please. Yes, I do want to um, give some advice to the Taiwanese parents and music students as well that learning music is a package deal. Yes. You have to learn the whole package so that you become a complete musician and a very full person. It's not about learning a three-minute piece for an an exam. Yes, (laughs) or do a recital, yes. Yes, Mm -hmm. and also I plead to the parents of Mm -hmm. all music students Mm -hmm. not to clip the wings of your children because they will lose their curiosity and wonder and passion. Mm -hmm. As a result, everything you, the parents, have invested in the children Mm -hmm. will not bear fruit. Because if they lose curiosity and passion, they have no imagination and creativity. Mm -hmm. What's an artist without imagination and creativity? creativity. Not an artist anymore. It's a dead end, yes. And Gwyneth, it's uh, wonderful to see that you have accomplished so much over the years. But I will imagine in the process, you also gave up a lot. You mm-hmm. know, for example, you know, your uh, fellow students will go out to the shopping mall mm-hmm. to you know, see a movie, but you were not able to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you had to go over to you know, strange places meeting, you know, you know, strange people, you know, and participate in very, you know, pressure heavy international competitions. You know, it is something that, you know, not everybody can do. Looking back, you know, when you made the choice at the age of five that you want to be a pianist, do you have any regret? You know, this is, that's a very good question because most people see it as 
sacrifice. They said, you sacrifice so much, you okay. give up so much, you must be so lonely, you know, in the practice room every day and you play concerts alone. As uh -huh. a pianist, usually you play alone. But I have to tell you, um, yes, I spend a lot of time alone at the piano and also away from the piano. Okay. But if that solitude okay. can bring joy to the listeners and make them excited and energetic, or it can move their hearts and souls and bring mm -hmm. tears to them, or it can bring calmness and serenity mm -hmm. to them to get them in touch with their inner self, then it's not a sacrifice. No. It's priceless. Mm -hmm. So how can it be a sacrifice? Okay. If it's so, to me, this is priceless. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a price tag. Okay. It's something money cannot buy. Okay. And this is very fulfilling, Yes, not lonely at all. Yeah, It's truly being an honor to have you on the program today, Gwyneth. We certainly want to wish you all the best in your future personal and professional endeavors. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching our program today. I'll see you next time on Macroview Television. Thank you. Mm -hmm.